Whoa, I'm super zoomed in. Okay, that is, that is way too much, Dave. Today is a very exciting day for me. I am at the NASA Ames Research Center with my friends Emily and Audra. Hello. Audra works here, so she's managed to arrange it, which I am so thankful for. I really appreciate it. And we're gonna snoop around today and try and see a few things, ask a few questions. I wanna know what these guys are working on, what they're thinking about, what cool stuff's coming up, and see if there's maybe some ways to sort of join in with the fun. Thank you, sir. Check out my sweet badge. The world's biggest wind tunnel. Now we got to Audra's office. This is a lot more friendly looking. A couple of great photos of Emily as a little one. So my first tour of the day was in Future Flight Central. Holy mother of... <laughs> yeah, so th this is... <laughs> yes! One of the big reasons why this facility is so unique. This is LAX. Yes. Look, they're planes moving and everything. Check this little plane coming in. He's on his way in. Moving that tower at LAX, like 100 meters over there, because it would be more strategic, would cost millions and you wouldn't really know whether it was going to be right we or not. We don't know what the impact is, right? But in here, we can just press our PlayStation controller and start moving around and imagining what it would be like if we were in different places. And so we did that for SFO. And you did that? Yeah. And did they end up moving their tower? Yep. Yeah. Wow. That is the beauty of virtual environments, is the, the low cost of trial and error. We're actually saving money in the long run and yeah. providing a safer sort of environment for everyone. So I don't know if you guys have seen The Martian yet, but I watched it on the plane <laughs> over here. And these are pictures taken from the rover on Mars. And they've put it together in this 360 simulation. So this is about as close as I'll probably get to being Matt Damon on Mars. So the rovers were only kind of insured for 90 days, but one of them's still rolling 10 years later. And these are the solar panels that are on Mars that power the rovers and keep them rolling around. Martian winds are in the hundreds of miles wow. per hour, but when you actually, like, let's say you're walking on Mars, you wouldn't really feel it. And the reason why is the atmosphere is so thin, even though it's fast, you don't feel it. Huh. Why does having a thicker atmosphere mean that you can feel the wind? Well, think of it this way. If a flea hits you at 100 miles an hour, yeah. do you get knocked over? No. If a truck hits you going at 100 miles an hour, to get knocked over. So there's more mass. The kinetic energy you sort of impart is based on your velocity and yeah. mass. So a thin atmosphere effectively has less mass. And so it's a flea, not a truck hitting you. Exactly. Interesting, thank you. We are in the crater that they call the hole in one where they bounce the opportunity, the rover, it like hit the ground like a basketball mark over there and then landed in here in the crater. And this is the parachute that it came in on. So like super smart idea, let's just chuck the rover up there, make him bounce and land the hole in one, yeah. and then just like pop the parachute afterwards and then he can just zoom around with those solar panels. Genius. And Guys, that was incredible. I didn't ever think I'd get in-depth insight into what's going on on Mars from an astrophysics dude. Flight simulators. Oh my gosh. This is our pilot, Matt. Yeah. All right, since, okay. Since turned on, I'll follow you up. Go ahead and uh, Woo Amazing, amazing. All right, here we go, guys. I am so excited. This is freaking rad. Check it out. So we're on the runway now. This looks so freaking realistic. So we're at San Francisco airport. This is dusk right now. <laughs> I've flown into SFO so many times as well. I'll give you some pointers and then we'll do a takeoff. We'll fly around San Francisco and then we'll come back in. <laughs> this is land. amazing. These are the throttles. Yeah. And you want to keep them together because if you get asymmetric thrust, it'll pull the plane left and right. <laughs> Here we go. Represents the ground, so you are wings level. 
Yeah. And your airspeed is at 186 and slowly decreasing. You want to get it to the point where you can let go and the nose stays where, where you want it. I'm flying 290 knots and I'm level and my steering wheel is level. Do you feel no pressure? I feel pretty Perfect. good. Yeah, you hey! Woo -hoo -hoo. We're right. airborne! Alright. How does it feel to be a passenger in Erasmus Airways? I like Just the name. Fine. 30. Perfect. Hold 10. Right there. They say they do nearly all of the training for these guys in those simulators because it's directly transposable. So I guess the question is, to what extent, what other situations and use cases can we create virtual experiences that could dramatically increase our ability to function uh, in the wider, more biological world? So we are heading in now to see the vertical motion simulator, right? Mm -hmm. A unique feature of the simulator as well is that all the degrees of freedom are uh, uncoupled. <laughs> what is the, this is freaking massive. This is a 10 story building. Huh. And uh, yeah, the simulator moves around in this space. Uh, you can clearly see the vertical track here and the lateral track as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an airliner? Yeah, this is an airliner. Wow. Really what they're trying to do is get a standard for motion cues for pilots and simulations and to avoid any interference from false cues. Would yeah. that be correct? Exactly. Yeah. And so this is what his research is doing is fine tuning, fine tweaking what is the exact right conditions to provide the optimum training to get them as ready as possible to fly. Yeah, that's correct. Go on, yeah. go on. This is a list of all the astronauts that have trained in this simulator to figure out how to fly shuttles. This is the moon lander cab. All right. This is totally badass. <laughs> the most insane part of this whole system is actually the intelligence or the brain, the central nervous system that glues all of these different modules together to talk to one another in real time. Each lab can operate independently, do mm -hmm. independent research, or connect them all together. Oh wow! Can you rig it so that he's showing up on their map here? That is really clever. So you could take off in SFO, and could you land in LAX and then still... Oh my gosh. So I'm interested, when these uh, modules, I guess, were built, was the plan that you would connect them all, or is that an evolution, do you know? An evolution, that's smart. So basically there's four major centers that, in the full simulations, we're trying to sort of help people feel um, and in these situations it's kind of low fidelity just a simulation model and here we're looking at really engaging all the different senses that make you feel that it's a real experience. My final stop of the day was with Dr. Alonzo Vera, Chief of Human Systems Integration and a PhD in AI. Computers on this axis and humans on this axis mm -hmm. okay and then you've got you know what he calls search knowledge and so you've got how much can you search right mm -hmm. Uh, you know, 10 to the 10, right? And this is, you know, he was thinking of Moore's Law. In humans, it's called preparedness. You're not searching. Mm. If you're, what we are good at as humans is you've built up all this knowledge over time and you just have access to little, mm. like, chunks of knowledge, right? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, you're not, like, searching every time. And what you said before, see, he calls these equi-performance ISO bars. Okay. What he means by that is that a computer that can search that fast for certain kind of tasks can look just like a human. Yes. And it seems like it's the same kind of intelligence, but it's not. No, yeah, because it's coming from the different angle altogether. Right. And so, and then the interesting question becomes exactly the question mm. you've been asking, which is then, okay, well, how is it different? Mm -hmm. Right, which part is it that, you know, and I hadn't thought of, again, like the thing that, you know, the, you know, the dancing the, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's about that, 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 that intimate coordination with the world in, in, in a kind of very direct response. Okay, so my brain is getting absolutely fried here. It's a whistle-stop education in AI. 
But what he mentions is an analogy that I brought up about dancing and how I feel that partner dancing with new partners to new music is one of the most human activities that we can do. But we go on in our conversation. I guess the summary for me of all the things we've just talked about is probably wrapped up in one question, um, I think, and I'd love to hear your answer to it, uh, which is, what do you think it is to be human? Mm, all right, so yeah, so in the context of what we've been talking about, what's interesting about humans is that, that we've got so much of the animal left in us, mm -hmm. right? And so, and that's the part that, you know, when we're looking at, you know, increasing machine intelligence, you know, we're not even touching, right? So we're, th we're these, you know, perversely complex homeostatic machines that, that, that are, you know, something gets damaged, something else fixes it. We're constantly reacting to the world in ways that we're not even aware of. And that all comes together then with a, you know, a, a brain that gives you, uh, uh, you know, a, a way to adaptively solve problems, to, to make tools, to... Mm -hmm to figure out better ways of doing it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but it, that's all based, again, on, on the nature of our, you know, very physical interaction of the world. When you're imagining the future, right, about intelligence in general, combination between human, biological, and kind of machine intelligence, what is it that you think will be most useful, and what should we be steering our energies and attention towards to actually do some useful things with the advances we're making? Let me give you an example. Um, I have a tree house in my backyard. When people come, they go, oh, it's a nice tree house. Did you build it? And I'm always like, yeah, I, I did largely build it. But what, what actually happened is, you know, I have a really good friend who, um, who was visiting, uh, and he's an architect. And, you know, my wife told him that I had promised my son that I would build him a tree house by the time he was six. And that summer that he was six was going to come and go, and no tree house was going to get built. And he got excited about it. And he, you know, we sat down, we kind of designed it, but mostly he, you know, kind of drew it out. He worked out everything we had to go buy, we bought it, and you know, I probably did you know, 60, 70% of labor, right? But, you know, so in a way I built it, yeah. right? But, but really the design, the, the, the working it out, the solving the problems was him. And as he, you know, as I, like if I was cutting something, he'd always be keeping an eye on it, no, no, like, that's a little less of an angle on that cut, right? Things mm -hmm. like that. Sometimes when I tell AI people that story, they go, well, the future is you won't need you a robot will do your part. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's exactly wrong. What I don't need is the architect. I've got good hands and I've got good eyes and I've got good, you know, you know I can solve some of the local problems, but that expert system could mm -hmm. come from outside. If that system can sufficiently understand what I'm up to, which is again, mm -hmm. like the internet of things, the augmented <coughs> virtual worlds, the yeah. wearables, all that changes the system's ability. Yeah. So I think that machine expertise will be able to ma be made more relevant and interactive with human activity mm -hmm. to, to kind of better take advantage of it. So, okay, so I find that fascinating, not least of all because me and my buddy are trying to get hold of some land and build some tree houses at the moment. <laughs> uh, I actually have a log cabin in my garden, which mm -hmm. when I'm back in London, I, I stay in as well. But, um, so I'm very familiar. My dad's just asked me to build a shed with him. And interestingly, he said to me, he rang me up two weeks ago and said, would you build a shed with me? And I was like, oh, I don't know. And he said, no, no, I just want you to understand, we're not doing it flat pack, we're doing it like from scratch, we're going to figure it out ourselves, getting designs off the internet. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm up for that. It's interesting right, to me right. to have that creative interest, although we will use the internet for design. So I guess in that process, I'm seeing three steps, though, to actually making what did you make this? You know, one is the hands and feet. Yeah. The other is the design and architecture. But the first was the stimulus, like the idea, the, the, the query, the question, like you made it known to your friend that this is what you wanted, the intent was there at the beginning. Knowing answers is not really that interesting. Knowing the right question to query a database yeah. is vital, like coming up with that, having the stimulus to query some other intelligence, human or machine, and then maybe you fulfill the, the third part as well, the actual delivery, the intricacies, the eagle landing in and grabbing that mouse who doesn't want to be grabbed, you know? Right. Like that, and so maybe there's like no, three no, right. That's a good point, right, right, the whole, you know, we're going to put it, we're going to, you know, A, a we want this thing, we're going to put it here. Mm. All of that is part of the, that has to come from a human. And maybe that's the hardest problem to solve with machine intelligence, that genuinely creative impetus where you look at the environment you're in and go, I want to do this. Yeah. Thank you so much. I would love to talk all day with you. Um, <coughs> maybe one day I can come back and show you more about what I've been thinking through. Yeah. Um, I'd love it. Yeah.
Oh, that's it. We're in the car. I'm on the way back. Gonna keep this badge as a souvenir. Thank you guys so much for an amazing day. Thank you. You're my heroes. Um, wow, uh, so much to think about. So many different kinds of conversations and experiences. I'll see you soon. Peace.